now for the first time in the state of Wisconsin, as participants in today's session, you are lucky enough to play the amazing dynamic assessment game. <laughs> um, in this game, we'll, we will review five examples and we want you to consider the details of each example and then we'll ask you to weigh in on whether you think it is an example of dynamic assessment or not. Later, there will be breakout groups and in your breakout group, you could decide to look at these examples further and then also talk about whether the examples support difference or disability. But for now, as you're listening to the examples, consider if they include intentionality, meaning, transcendence, competence, child responsivity, transfer, and examiner, examiner effort. Okay, so we'll go on to the first example. At an initial evaluation meeting, a teacher shared the concern that a student did not know any teacher's names except the PE teacher's name. So the SLP created a list of teacher names for that student with the IEP team. The SLP had a discussion with the student about what strategy or what that student did to learn the PE teacher's name. The student shared that their favorite time at school was in PE, so that made it easier for the student to learn the name. So the SLP and the student also discussed why it is important to use accurate names when talking with people, including all staff at school, not only the PE teacher. After the child described what their strategy was that they used, the SLP and child practiced that strategy with the list of the student's teachers. Um, and this was with limited repetition, limited cueing, limited effort from the speech language pathologists, and visuals were not necessary. During an observation a few days later, the speech language pathologist noted that the student had started using other teachers' names and transferred this skill by using teacher names in multiple locations in the school. And when the SLP interviewed the student, the student reported consciously thinking about how and when to apply the strategy. So we would like you to weigh in in the chat please let us know by answering yes or no, was this an example of dynamic assessment? Yes, <laughs> this was an example of dynamic assessment. The speech language pathologist conducted a brief mediated learning experience. It included that direct teaching, the limited cueing, the SLP collected data about the student's ability to change and also um, apply that learning. This was an effective collaborative process and there was a high level of student responsiveness and modifiability and a very low effort of SLP effort in scaffolding. Excellent. Okay, so now we can go on to example number two. A first grade student was being evaluated for concerns about the production of S, L, and R. I'd like, like you to know this was a, a real example from Andrea. <laughs> um, although the student produced these sounds incorrectly on formal assessments, they were stimulable for correct production within a few sessions of direct instruction when provided with verbal models and placement cues. During these teaching sessions, the student was focused and self-monitored their own productions. The speech language pathologist and the student discussed the importance of others understanding what we say to communicate. During a post-test, the student was able to produce some instances of the targeted sounds correctly at the sentence level in the speech and language room and in the classroom. And then later when a, the speech language pathologist completed an observation, it was noted that the student was working to self-correct error productions. So now think about this example and indicate in the chat, yes or no, did the speech language pathologist complete dynamic assessment. 
I'm sure you're also thinking, um, would this student be found eligible when considering the speech and language eligibility criteria? But just for now, think about, is this dynamic assessment? And I think I'm seeing so many yeses. Right. Yes. So many. Okay. <laughs> so many. <And> yes. <laughs> Correct. Yes. The child was very responsive when interacting with the speech language pathologist. Um, and it was a mediated learning experience. The child began transferring the skills right away and all with minimal effort from the speech language pathologist. Um, during the session, the importance of being understood during communication was discussed and the student un understood this as evidenced by the fact that the student was working to transfer the skill and was self-correcting their own productions, all again with minimal effort from the speech language pathologist. Okay, so you're ready for example number three. A collected and transcribed narrative language sample demonstrated a student's needs in the area of the use of story grammar elements. The speech language pathologist met with the student two times and directly taught and modeled the story grammar structural elements of beginning, middle, and end by using a wordless picture book verbal models, a high level of cueing, repetition, drawings, and visuals, in addition to many cues to focus on the task and maintain attention were provided. The student and the speech language pathologist discussed the importance of retelling stories and sharing these stories with others. With a high level of speech language pathologist effort, so adult effort, the student produced a beginning, middle, and end when retelling the story by imitating the SLP's model, but in shorter utterances, only when provided with many supportive prompts. In another collected narrative language sample about a different book, the student's narrative of the new story did not include a beginning, middle, or end of the story. So again, consider this example and let us know in the chat, is this an example of dynamic assessment? Yes or no? Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> I see many, many yeses. <laughs> And yes, that was another example of dynamic assessment. Even though the child just demonstrated a low level of modifiability, it was a mediated learning experience. The child needed cues to focus and to maintain attention to the task. Um, the child did not transfer and apply the skills, but it was a mediated learning experience. Also, the speech language pathologist had to provide a progressively higher level of support, including those verbal models, cueing, repetition, drawing, and eventually visuals. The speech language pathologist also had to provide cues to focus on the task and to maintain attention. But yes, this is an example of dynamic assessment and a mediated learning example. So we will move on to example four. The IEP team noted concerns, including that the student had difficulty following directions, retelling stories, learning new vocabulary, and used short utterances with many grammatical errors. The SLP administered and scored the self five. Then the SLP administered the self five in Spanish. A language sample was collected and transcribed. The SLP felt there was enough information to consider impairment and started writing their individual report. So again, let us know in the chat, is this an example of dynamic assessment, yes or no? Nope, nope, nope. <laughs> <laughs> that is correct. No, this was not an example of dynamic assessment. 
Um, remember the self is a static decontextualized test. And when we're using that four-step comprehensive assessment process, this would not provide us enough information to consider eligibility criteria. Um, because in this example, the SLP did not measure modifiability or what the child could explicitly learn or learn with explicit instruction. Remember that norm reference tests assume that all children have had the same experiences, opportunities, and exposure. And also norm reference tests, um, the skills evaluated by these tests are often more associated with culture or with social, social economic status, um, such as vocabulary, rather than a true language impairment. Okay, so I think we're going on. This is our last example. An IEP team had a concern that a student had a limited vocabulary that affected listener understanding of the student's short utterances. The student labeled all fruits and vegetables using the word banana. The SLP used a set of 10 fruits and vegetables that the family identified as common at home and pre-tested the student on these labels using photographs. Next, the speech language pathologist taught the student that there are special names for things and over two sessions taught the special names of the 10 pre-tested fruits and vegetables. The student maintained a high level of attention yet required multiple verbal models, prompts from the SLP. The SLP used a shortened length of utterance to communicate. The SLP provided many repetitions and in the end needed to use concrete objects instead of just photographs to label so that the student would label some of the items correctly. Then the speech language pathologist retested the set of 10 fruit and vegetable labels the student labeled three of the 10 correctly. When the SLP joined the student during lunch at school, the student labeled all food items as banana. So now consider this example, please, and let us know in the chat, yes or no, is this an example of dynamic assessment? If I can just say one thing here. Um, uh -huh. This SLP was teaching to the test, and that is what dynamic assessment includes. We are able to strip away all of that mystery of why we're doing this and just say, this is what I need you to learn. And so teaching specifically what the target was, teaching to the test is dynamic assessment. Awesome. Okay. So I saw many yeses in this. That is correct. The child was responsive to the mediated learning experience, maintained a high level of attention. Um, the student worked to apply the learning strategy, but did not show evidence of a high level of transfer of the skill beyond the session, but it was still a mediated learning experience that provided lots of data for the speech language pathologist. Um, more explicit teaching and repetition of this skill would likely be necessary to increase learning and generalize or transfer the skill. Um, and perhaps based upon other assessment data collected in uh, that the four step comprehensive assessment, perhaps a language impairment instead of a difference might be considered by this team. So one of my favorite quotes is, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And that's why I appreciate everyone being here together today. Um, as we work more on focusing and utilizing dynamic assessment um, as one of our tools, um, let's, I hope we can create together a shared document across the state of some dynamic assessment task ideas. So let's be each other's scaffolding and knowledgeable other um, to learn and raise all of our knowledge to another level. 
So this is the time where we would um, hope that most of you, if not all of you, would stay um, to do some practicing uh, and discussing around dynamic assessment. And we did, um, Daniel shared the, the copy um, of the um, Padlet earlier. Sorry about that. Um, there's some activities that we have for you. Um, like Lisa said, there's examples um, and we would encourage you to look at them in your small group um, and, um, and look, about the, look at the, accept, the success of the dynamic uh, assessment. How responsive was the student? How much effort did, was required? Um, so that's one of the activities you could do in the, in the breakout room. Um, I'm actually gonna go to the Padlet so there's the examples from today that you could look at. Um, and I did put in your participant folder, this eligibility considerations um, document that we're, we're putting together at DPI. So you could use this too, because remember dynamic assessment is just one piece of the puzzle, right? And so you'd be looking at how does this fit um, with all the other information that you're gathering uh, to determine whether or not there's an impairment. Um, so I shared that with you today too. So you could use that or think about that as you're looking at the examples. Um, and you could, if you do, would like to work independently, feel free to not join a breakout room and you could spend your time looking at those. We also have a five minute um, YouTube video from Bilinguistics um, that goes into uh, a case example of um, dynamic assessment using the protocol from Bilinguistics. Uh, so you could do that. You could also look at the protocol review. You could spend your time looking at that. And then this is where you could um, have, what, what questions do you have, right? So um, there were a couple questions in the Padlet. Marie's answered them. Um, wondering if anyone wants to share out at all, um, any ahas from their discussions. Um, you can unmute yourself or you could um, put it in the chat. Um, one thing to note that Lisa just put in the chat a link to the SLP Nerdcast, which is a podcast that um, it's a good one, uh, but I've only listened to this episode actually. So yes, it's about dynamic assessment and um, they interview a couple of um, the test makers for the Pearl, which is a formal dynamic assessment, which we did not get into today. But um, Trina Spencer and um, Peterson, I can't remember his first name, but um, he interviewed them and it, it, they talk about RTI. Uh, it's the only, Marie was saying how it's the only dynamic assessment in RTI kind of conversation she's read or heard about. So if you're interested in that, it's worth um, listening to that podcast. But anyone would love to hear discuss what you all discussed. Hi, Andrea. It's hi. Jill. Yes, <laughs> hi. You? Good. Good. Um, I was lucky to be with Paula in, in uh, who knows a lot, and I'm new to this, but we were talking about um, how maybe standardized testing, what we're thinking about the length of the tests that we do now, the standardized tests, and wondering if it's moving toward having it be like a quarter of what we're doing. Maybe we can't be doing hour and a half you know, selves and, and just wondering, I know we've gotten away from screening. We used to screen a million years ago. Um, I just don't know if they're looking at shortening some of the tests and trying to get more to the point instead of like pounding over and over the same thing um, to get the kid to score. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> Sounds like a question for Pearson. Pearson. <laughs> I think well, one way to think about that, Jill, is maybe, you know, since we're not getting as much information from tests for our English learners or mm -hmm. kids of diverse backgrounds, you know, is it worth giving all the subtests? You know, I mean, that's kind of, you know, at this point, not something we're going to completely toss out, but, um, you know, you might get a lot more information from especially if they're already on your caseload, your therapy data, you know, which is why like is testing really going to make a big difference at a reeval, you know, but if it's initial, it's kind of hard to get away from the tests, but you might, you know, just give the minimum 
so that you get a score that you're not really going to report anyway, but use those as kind of your baselines for the dynamic assessment or use that as kind of a, a starting point of doing an MLE, you know, and like you said in the chat, like, yeah, they, sometimes you just want to say like, when I say first, it means start on the left side of the book, not the right side, because then it messes them up, you know? So if you could just kind of intervene and give them some of that scaffolding that they need to be more successful and then kind of go from there and get more information about the child rather than just worrying about the score. It's an option to think about. And I was going to say, this is Paula, that we don't have to worry so much about giving so many tests, mm -hmm. you know, like trying to find the exact right test that gives us the score that shows us what we want to show. So we just keep throwing all these tests at this kid. If mm -hmm. we, if we're thinking about having all these other ways of assessing the kid, then we're not spending so much time going, well, I know they're having trouble with narratives. So I'm going to give them the test of narrative language. And I'm going to give them this and give them that. And, you know, we, we're not so dependent on those test scores because we have other ways of looking at what the kid can do. Mm -hmm. I've read Paula kind of exactly, well, piggybacking off of that is that perhaps you wouldn't reach for um, a vocabulary test, a, an understanding or an expressive use of vocabulary, especially if a student is from a culturally or linguistically diverse background, perhaps instead you try an MLE because then you would know um, about that student's ability to learn vocabulary given the experience. I would just add on that, Lisa, the evidence also aligns with low SES aside from culture and race um, for vocabulary tests. Um, I often say like, if you want more bang for your buck, <laughs> don't go down the vocabulary aisle. Right. Right. Um, but I was just gonna add too, I think that there are a couple of other things that we can do to select um, better tools versus the like, you know, throw it all at them. Um, this is something I really love. So I think this is an excellent question. Um, and it was funny when someone said this is a question for Pearson, because I actually got Pearson reps to present on this with me. And one of the things that we talk a lot about is eliminating tools with poor sensitivity and specificity. Um, take some time and actually look at how sensitive is your tool at identifying. We like to think that they wouldn't sell us tools that are poor at identifying a disability, um, but some of them really don't meet the criteria for identifying a language disability. Um, and then I think that uh, we can be more, which someone already alluded to, being more selective with your subtests and mm -hmm. which of those do you really need to provide an index score and do you really need all of the indices in a global tool? So not administering the entire tool, but being selective with the indices that you know align with the areas of concern for a student and then um, considering selecting more uh, specific tools, tools that are not global or omnibus, but if you really do know there are grammar concerns, then go for your spelt, go for those tools that are only aligning, you know, specifically with those areas of concern. And then um, I, yeah, I think that those were just some of those thoughts that I had. Thanks. Thanks always for sharing, <laughs> I Courtney. I think there was someone, did someone raise their hand? Oh, I didn't see that. I was just clapping. Oh, you were clapping. Oh, yay, okay, Kaylee, yeah. yes. <laughs> hold on. So hold on. I want to, um, a couple things here. Uh, as long as I, I'm going to try and keep you as long as I can. Resources. There are so there there aren't a ton of resources, but there are many resources. So it's it's interesting. Like Asha has some things. Bilinguistics has things. Leaders Project, um, the Informed SLP. You know I love them. Um, they've got something on. Remember what dynamic assessment is. You know. So it, like it it is around. But one thing I am wondering, and I'm hoping that um, in the minute or two that we have left today. If you could think for a minute um, and put in the chat, what what is one action item you plan to start, um, enhance, or stop as a result of what you learned from this training? Um, 
and or what kind of support do you need in order to be able to implement the change as a result of what you learned today? Um, I think one of the big things that Lisa and Marie and I came away from this, putting this together was that there's only so much you can say in an hour and a half <laughs> and that um, we are hoping this is the first of more to come, right? Like there, we need to have more conversations about dynamic assessment. There is so much we, more to say. Um, Good. So someone said they're going to stop using static measurements and move to dynamic or, I, you know, the idea, especially for English learn for English learners who we don't have a norm reference test for. Absolutely. But for um, perhaps adding dynamic assessment with some of our static uh, tools would also be, you know, looking at a balance, looking at getting something from all four quadrants. Right. We want to get. Um, get more information. We want to get the real information of how kids interact, right? Um, rethinking using vocabulary tests. Yes. I think one of the things to come, you know, um, one of the things to come is the limitations of norm referenced assessments. It is something we'll be talking about soon. Lisa and Marie, thank you so much for your help with this. Um, it's been really fun collaborating and everyone else who um, has helped in all of this. So take care. Thanks a lot for coming.